So, uh, in your discussion, um, what are some things that uh, came out of your discussion? Anybody, anybody want to share uh, what you guys discussed, what you guys talked about? Anyone? Yeah, find the back, yeah. Your, your name again? Maria. Maria, okay, pretty names. Um, well, I, I experienced this, and then we all kind of agreed on it, that while we were reading this, that, um, you go through life and you make a lot of uh, decisions about your life and a yeah. lot of choices because we have a free will that God gave us. Yeah. And you know, you make mistakes and you hopefully learn from them. But what of anything you're doing with your life is God's purpose for you? How do you figure that out? How do you know, you know, okay, I'm a social worker and is yeah. that what God wants me to be doing? Is that my career choice? And how does that play out in ministry? Mm. Great question to life, right? Yeah. Am I doing what am I doing right? Where's my ministry on top of that? Good. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? The, yeah. one, the one thing that hit me, I took your uh, course in the fall, uh, Greatest Choices in the Naked World. Yeah. And I sat down and I started reading these questions. And it was like, oh my goodness, here I am, back six months ago. Think, things that I should have scaled down on. Back then? Back then. Yeah. God was telling me to scale down on, and I did. Yeah. Here I am, right back again. He's like, you know. Yeah, and you and I talked together personally that there, there are things that you, you, that you, you wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad we got folks about that. Anyone else? Yes, yeah. Um, I know better what my role is. I mean, ever since I took the 301 yeah. um, over the weekend, I always wanted to serve. I just wasn't sure where, and I got a clearer picture yeah. of what I should be doing. Okay. And, and it's almost like it's time to get out of the book and walk on the wall. Yeah. Good. Sure, sure. I've been wrong. For me, you know, my main role I know God's given me is, is a mother right now with little children. So yeah. I, most of the time I can be okay with that. And that's my ministry is my kids. I was telling them. But then there's other times I'm like, all right, I need to do more. Yeah. And what else do you, you know, yeah. you have for me? But then you don't want to get too much on your plate where you're overwhelmed and it makes you crazy. And, and yeah. the family's falling apart because you're Correct. serving too much or whatever, so. You know, that balance. You know, yeah, what a lot of, a lot of us have kids, yeah. you know, yeah. that's like, so. So, exactly. Ron? Well, I guess, you know, when I, when I read it, the, the part that really kind of spoke to me was, you know, the predestined part. Yeah. You know, that's something that I really gave a lot of thought to. Yeah. You know, in other words, you know, that he's created us for a special purpose. Yeah. You know, that he's gifted us all differently yeah. and that he's using us, um, you know, as part of the body. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I really enjoyed that part because it wasn't a part that I thought a lot about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but the, you know, I guess put a smile on my face to know that, you know, he created me for a very special purpose. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It's awesome. That's <laughs> cool. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing, everybody. Thanks for sharing in your groups. Tonight's topic is called Discovering and Understanding the Gifts. And, and many of you are going to want to uh, have this for multiple weeks uh, and, have, and have a long conversation about this because there's a lot of content on it. But there's, we have to keep it to one week, so I apologize for that. What I want you to do is um, somewhere, either on the back of your book, on the back page, or there's a bunch of blank pages. Um, and there's like two blank pages or so, any blank spot, I want you to answer uh, this question uh, right now. So, uh, the back of your book, one of the back spots, one of the blank pages at the end, answer this question. What do you expect God to do in your life at the end of this class? Not meaning tonight, but at the end of our eight weeks in May. So what do you expect God to do in your life? At the end of our eighth session, the end of May, how do you want God to work in your life? Answer that question. Sure. What do you expect God to do in your life at the end of our eight week session together?
and just to, uh, to be clear, um, you know, uh, sometimes the word expect is, is used uh, in a wrong way, like it's sort of like a demanding way. You know, and, and in no way are we uh, demanding God to do what we're writing down, right? But what the, the point of this is to have an expectation that God is going to work in your life and to put it on paper. And what we're going to do, hopefully, is we're going to come back at the end of the session. We're gonna, we're, I'm going to have you guys read that and, and see um, where God has taken you from the beginning part of this class to the end of this class. So with that being said, if you're still writing, you can continue to write. With that being said, I want to pray over um, our, our class not tonight, but also over what you wrote. And it's going to bring it up to God and offer that up to Him, alright? Father God, I just want to thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for the group of individuals uh, who have gathered in this room, who have sacrificed their Wednesday night uh, to be here uh, in your presence, uh, in worship and in submission uh, to what you have to teach us, Lord. Father, we want to uh, commit uh, this night to you tonight, that everything uh, that is said is glorified to you, that your Holy Spirit gives us insight uh, into what you may have for us tonight. Allow us to not only just learn, but also to be uh, transformed and made anew in your sight. God, we also want to pray for what we wrote down in these, in, in our notes, in our books. God, we, we wrote down what we expected you to do in our lives at the end of these um, eight weeks. So Lord, uh, I pray that you exceed our expectations and you blow our minds in what you can do in our lives if we're willing to submit to you. So we offer all this to you and we offer um, our hopes and our passions and our dreams and our desires all to you. Put it in your hands, the creator, the one who has formed us and created us on this earth to serve a good purpose. Proud in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, page 65 in your book, like page 65. What we're going to do is we're going to do uh, a brief look at the spiritual gifts in the Bible. A brief sort of study on the spiritual gifts. And I, I do want to make a sort of a little intro to that is we're not going to spend time defining them. Okay? We are not going to spend time defining them. Um, and there's a reason why we're not going to spend time defining them. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, pinpoint that later on. If, if you want a certain, if, if there's a gift that you want a definition on, um, I just have a big little note and email me this week. But there's a reason why we're not going to focus on the definition of the gift. Here on page 55, you have some blank spots. And when people talk about the study of spiritual gifts, there are usually, there's, there's four major passages that are considered passages that lift the spiritual gifts. And you, you have them listed on the page 55 and so on. And I'm going to go through uh, each passage and... Uh, List the gifts. So number one, if you want to write this down and turn to it in your Bible, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. If you want to turn that to as well, uh, let's, let's, let's all get there, and then when we'll, we'll call come to that, I want to have a volunteer to read Ephesians 4, verse 11. The fourth is 
pastor. And the fifth is teacher. Once again, these are, we're looking at the major passages that people consider uh, to be listed spiritual gifts. So the first one is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Apostles, prophets, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Number two, please write this down and then turn to it as well in your Bible. The second passage is Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Write this down and turn to it. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Oh, um, FYI, if you want to bookmark these for tonight, because we're going to turn back to them later tonight, so I suggest if you want to bookmark uh, Ephesians 4, we'll have it, put, a little, put a little pen or paper on it, and then we'll, we'll go back to that uh, later tonight. But even if you have a digital Bible, it's a lot easier. You can just turn to it real quickly. So Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, and I want someone to volunteer and read that one, please. Yep, Second bullet point, prophets. 
and, and some of these we've repeated from previous list. So we have apostles number one, we have prophets number two, bullet point number three, we have teachers. Teachers. Fourth bullet point, we have miracles. Miracles. Uh, the fifth bullet point, healings. Healings. The next one, bullet point, is helps. Helps, H-E-L-P-S, helps. Next bullet point, administration. Administration. I don't have that in mind. In what? NIV. Does it have administration? Um. What's it say after? You say cover. After um, what? Helper? Yeah. Helping guidance. Guidance. And then comes. Except the prophet. Except the prophet. Helping with guidance. And different kinds of tongues. I, some 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 um, scholars that of guidance they attribute that to administration. Okay. That thanks, Ron. It's required by that. The second to last bullet point: different kinds of tongues or speaking tongues. Different kind of tongues, and speaking tongues. And the last bullet point is interpretation of tongues. So let's go over them again. Yeah, there's a big list. We have apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, administration, different kinds of tongues, or speaking in tongues, and then interpretation of tongues. So we, we, we should be done all three. Now we should have a fourth one. And the fourth one is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. If I, if I, if you could write that down and also turn to it, oh, you don't have to turn it, you should already be there. Uh, can I have a volunteer to read that section, please? Rachel? For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's we're, we're going to get down. The first one is a word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Second bullet point: word of knowledge. Word of knowledge. We have word of wisdom, word of knowledge. The third is faith. Faith is number three. Fourth is healings. Healings. The fifth is workings of miracles. Workings of miracles. The sixth is prophecy. Prophecy. The seventh, distinguishing of spirits. Distinguishing of spirits. Number eight is kinds of tongues. Kinds of tongues. And then the ninth bullet point. It may be on page 66, or the last bullet point may not be there, or maybe on page 67. 
But, but regardless, there should be a nice bullet point, and it should be interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues. So there's word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healings, workings of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, kinds of tongues, and then interpretation of tongues. Um, we actually are going to do a whole session on this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Actually, session 6 in uh, next month. We're actually going to do a whole session on this, and you understand why when we get there. All right, turn to page 67. So, but I wanted, I wanted to give you the overview. I wanted to give you an overview of what people consider are the spiritual gifts. Yes, Ron. Um, I was looking online, and I was looking online, and I was looking what the gifts were. Yes. Came across a few different lists. One of the seven spiritual gift lists, which is Romans 12, and the nine gifts, the nine gift lists, gift lists, which is a combination of Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, and the 14 gift lists, which is for customized profiles only, and the 16 gift list. Yeah. So, Ron, before you before you get before you get on the rabbit, Ron, before you get on the rabbit trail, yeah. the, this 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 lesson is sort of is going to answer. Basically everything in that. I'm just saying that there is more than just the ones you listed here. Which is what I want to talk about in, in, in okay. the rest of the night. Yeah. Right. So, uh, well, broader, I'm going to jump to it then. I'm going to jump forward a little bit. Alright, so, what, what, I'm, going to, I'm going to go forward a little bit. Um, the point of, is that there's no definitive, definitive list in the Bible. Okay? So, Paul, the, who wrote these passages for Corinthians, Romans, and Ephesians, he is um, uh, notorious for making lists. He loves lists. He loves listing sins. He loves listing attributes of godliness. He loves listing uh, things. And he loves to give examples. Okay? And what this, this is why Ron brought it up, is because the answer is, if somebody asks you how many gifts in the Bible, there's no definitive answer. I don't believe that Paul wrote these letters to these churches as a definitive list. And too many times we make uh, the list definitive. You look at, if you look at all Paul's writings and all of his epistles and everything, and he wrote a lot of different lists, and none of them were actually ever the same, which is why some of the gifts are different. But the point is, the biggest reason why, the biggest reason why we are not going to define these gifts is because the Gifts and also this class, it's never about the gifts. Okay? It is never about the gifts. Now, sometimes we get wrong in our Christian faith and we focus too much on the gifts. It, instead of focusing on the gifts, the most important thing we need to understand is, is how to be used by the Spirit, not what the gifts are. And hopefully, by Beth and I, we'll be able to get to flush it out a little more. Page 67, please. So we're going to try to understand spiritual gifts as they're listed in the Bible. So the question I have on top of page 67 is this. And this is sort of the question that we're going to try to wrestle with tonight is this. Does the Holy Spirit give special abilities that we must discover? Or, or does the Holy Spirit call and place us into various ministries that build up the community that he has formed. So the first question is, does the Holy Spirit give a special place that we must discover, or does the Holy Spirit call us into places and various ministries that build the community that he has formed? Now there are two views on spiritual gifts, and the first view is called the conventional view. So the conventional view is the first question that I pose, right? That the Holy Spirit is a special village that we must discover. So usually, Usually when Christians think of spiritual gifts, they think of spiritual gifts as um, this paradigm, this, this conventional paradigm that I want to call conventional. The approach says that spiritual gifts are abilities, enablements that, that are given by the Holy Spirit to help believers and to serve others. Right? And, and, and that's good, but people's focus on that is on the gifts themselves. So let me, let me give you an example. So there's many different 
definition of spiritual gifts. I, I, I gave you a really good one on, the, on the session one by um, the name uh, alludes me, but there's a really good definition of spiritual gifts. And there's many different definitions of spiritual gifts that people will have, but all definitions have three components, right? It's a, there's, there's an ability component, there, it is given by the Holy Spirit, and it's used to build up the believers, right? So the, the traditional approach that people have C. Peter Wagner, right? Yeah, C. Peter Wagner, thank you. Traditional or conventional, or any would call it, is this. The, whole, the spiritual gift is Holy Spirit given, which is true, given to the, given to the uh, individual, and all these gifts that we are given, all are abilities. Right? So we have abilities by the Holy Spirit. Right? So I have the ability of leadership, the ability of service, the ability of teaching, and it is to be used in ministry or the church. Okay. So the conventional view. The, the traditional view of, of spiritual gifts is that we have these sort of Holy Spirit given abilities that are used in the ministry of the church. Nothing wrong with that, but I want to try to give a different paradigm for us tonight, a, a little more clear picture of, of what Paul was aiming at when he was talking about spiritual gifts in the context of what he was writing in Romans and 1 Corinthians. So in this approach, Every believer, so someone who, has, someone who has a relationship with God, someone who believes in Jesus Christ, right, has one, at least one special ability that he or she must discover and use in building the community of faith. The point is that we have these abilities that um, we are told that, all right, you're a Christian now, so you need to discover what these are. So on the bottom of page 67, I'm going to have I'm going to teach them that. There's some fill in the blanks. So in this conventional approach, the traditional approach, the little bullet point is that these gifts need to be discovered. The little underlying you need to put down is discovered. How do you discover them? People usually maybe do a test, right? Maybe you, you serve and you and as you as you serve you you discover them. And, and sometimes people say take the test first and then and then serve, or some people say serve first and then discover. Another key aspect of this view is that every believer has a gift. Right? Every believer has a gift, and that is true. Can you comment? Huh? Can you comment on why God has us discovered? Versus are we gonna get there? We're gonna get there. The, 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 uh, so I'm going to do a conventional view, and then the biblical view, which is sort of going to kind of flip that around. Okay. Good. Third bullet point. A person could have gifts and not be using them. Such gifts lie dormant until the person discovers them and uses them. Another aspect is, can lead to jealousy, envy, and what gifts someone may have. Okay, so what, what we just talked about... I missed the second bullet Second one point, every believer has a gift. Okay. Third is, a person can use, have gifts and not be using them, so just by dormant, until the person discovers them and uses them. And the fourth is, can lead to jealousy or envy on what gifts someone may have. Alright, what we just talked about, okay, this is the traditional, this is the conventional view of spiritual gifts. That, as a Christian, when I become a follower of Christ, right, we have this belief that, that, the Holy Spirit gives each person at least one spiritual gift, and our goal in life as Christians when we become followers of Christ is to find this sort of um, magical box gift. Once we find it, that's when we're in our sweet spot, and then we may have, we have, we have other gifts as well, and that gift is used to serve in the ministry of the church. There's a many types of flaws on that. But it's all true that we have a building by the Holy Spirit. It's true that their gifts are used to build the body of the believer. But 
nowhere when, in Paul's writings, Paul's writings are actually, his Romans, his 1 Corinthians, his Ephesians, when he's writing the context of the letters of the church, those things he lists are actually ministries and not gifts. So let me show you what a second view is. I would call this the biblical view. It's actually presented, it's actually incorrect, slightly correct, yes. And I'm gonna to try to turn it around. So, page 68. You call this the alternative view of spiritual gifts or the Biblical view. So the first view was spiritual gifts as special abilities. Sort of like, you know, we're sort of like, you know, superheroes with special abilities. Okay? But the, when we're on page 68, the view is spiritual gifts as spiritual ministries. Spiritual ministries. On one side, you have the view of, uh, of the gifts being spiritual abilities. And the second aspect is the view of spiritual ministry. So we call this, uh, we, we'll call this the biblical. Biblical alternative view. So, when we look at our circle here, before, in the middle of our circle, we had all our abilities, the giftings, and, and the, the books that Paul writes. But actually, instead of giftings, all our ministries, and then in that, right, some of them, and some, are also abilities. I'm going to explain this a little more, and then I know you have a lot of questions, so we're going to dive, we're going to diagnose your questions with that. So this view, what it does is it puts spiritual gifts as spirit-given ministries, Holy Spirit-given ministries, and not special abilities. Based on all, based on Paul's writings, the spiritual gifts should not be viewed as much abilities to do ministry, rather they should be viewed as ministry themselves. When we break down Paul's writings and his use of lists and his use of gifts and his, his, community, his audience to the church in that time, to the church in Corinth especially was a good example, right? Those should be viewed as ministries themselves and not special abilities. So there's, the, the idea is that every believer, every Christ follower, has been assigned by the Holy Spirit to specific positions and activity of service, small and large, short term and long term. These ministry assignments have been given by the Holy Spirit to individual believers and in turn, these individuals in their ministry have been given as gifts to the local church. So the idea is that God has called us to special ministries, that he's empowered us, not special abilities. That in these ministries, we are also given abilities and empowerment to be used by the Holy Spirit, to be used for the kingdom. But the whole view, especially when we talk about Paul's list that people call it spiritual gifts list, they're actually ministry list. The title of this class was just trying to reflect that. Because when I was asked to teach a class on spiritual gifts, um, it was going to be called, whatever, spiritual gifts. And the more and more and more and more I did the research and the reading and studying Paul's writings and his context and everything, the more and more it, it, it came to the conclusion that the purpose of this is to be spirit-filled, to be used by the Holy Spirit, and to be used in any way possible. So the conventional approach says this, God, how can I discover the special abilities that you have given me? 
That's the conventional approach. God, how can I discover the gifts you've given me? Which for some people, it's really easy. And for some people in this room, I, th I think you could agree that it's not just really hard. Or it may take you a long time to get there. To try to start with that one, that one little gift that, that, I, that, I, that I'm supposed to have. And some people strive and make that an idol. And, and they, if they don't get there, they feel neglected. They feel left out. They feel unused because they, they couldn't find that one special thing. But the alternative approach, the biblical approach, is this. God, where do you want me to serve? God, where do you want me to serve? All right. Questions. I know you guys are probably just, it's quite a, I just flipped your mind on, 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 on your view of spiritual gifts. So the first question is that people have is, God... I need to discover my gifts. What are my gifts? The other aspect is, God, what do you want me to serve? What is my ministry? And through that, the Holy Spirit empowered me to do that ministry for the kingdom. Question or comments? Ron? I guess my comment is comment I made before. Is that God created me for a special purpose? Yeah. He already had prepared for me. Where he wants to, where he wants to use me. Yep, your ministry. And I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm thinking is that you know, um, kind of when he brings you where he brings you. Yeah. It's because you're ready. Yeah. And in the meantime, he's teaching. Yeah. You know, and growing, helping you grow. I think that's pretty cool because for a long, long time, I felt like what you said is, gee, I want to do something, but what do I do and how do I do it? And yeah. why don't you just tell me, God, so I can do it? And uh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just find that within the biblical alternative, basically, it's, it's God teaching us to actually just rely on Him. Mm -hmm. Where the other one is actually, we have a tendency to rely on our own self abilities. Yeah. You know what I see sometimes? I see some people that they have a gift. Let's say, let's say, and I've seen this. People say that I have the gift of teaching, right? Well, or not, not me, but the person, right? Like they have the gift of teaching. And I've been, oh, why aren't you using your gift? You know, and they're like, there's no opportunities. So, you know, so people, they go, like, oh, there's no word for me to keep, so I'm just waiting. Right, so so if you have this mindset that I have this one gift or there's one or two gifts and that's my thing, and if I nothing if nothing relates to that, I'm not going to be used by the kingdom. You're totally missing the point of of, of the New Testament and, and God using people. The whole point, especially the New Testament church and how that's being used, is people just being willing to be used, whatever, however, in any way possible. And through that becomes empowerment, gifts by the Holy Spirit to be used. So, let me give you. Go, Trisha, go ahead. So, what I hear you saying is that we can be used by God in any ministry and in any gift if we ask Him. Is that what you're saying? Like, it doesn't. If He puts you in a ministry, right? And there are gifts that you need to get that done. Yes. So, for example, let me let me let me let me let me, let me, let me pull one to um, my life. Um, I think I'll give a bit of better understanding. Um, the ministry that he has me, obviously, is the ministry of teaching. Okay, it's, it's a ministry of teaching in this season of my life. I, I didn't always have the ministry of teaching all the time. But this season of my life, the ministry that I have is the ministry of teaching. And through that ministry that I walk into, God has given me the gift of teaching. Obviously, I, I believe that there's a skill that I have as well. But with the Holy Spirit empowering that teaching gift, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a lot better than I could ever do. But through my ministry of teaching, God has also, Holy Spirit also given me other gifts that has made my ministry of teaching enhanced. So, God at different times gives me the gift of wisdom, right? Knowing how to 
form of class, form of club, club. No, knowing what to say or to write. Uh, uh, other times, God has given me the prophecy, saying prophetic words for people, right? And, and, and giving people the scripture at the right time or saying the right thing to their life or speaking into their life to encourage them. You know, uh, you know, other times God has given me the gift of knowledge, knowing things about someone that I would not have known otherwise and had been able to use that in my teaching. Or, 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 or other times that God has given me the faith to believe that my mere, pure human words can be totally transformed by the Holy Spirit and hit your heart in a way that I can never do that without apart from the Holy Spirit. So in the ministry that I have, in the ministry of teaching, comes empowerments and abilities to do things when I need to. Right? So, I don't always have um, this prophecy, right? So I'm not like going everywhere and just like, oh yeah, it is, it is, it is going to like people in the store and, and going with it, right? But when I'm operating the ministry, when I'm operating being spirit-filled, it comes to me at the time that I need it. Any other, any questions about it? Any, more, any questions? Yes. So traditional view is basically quenching the spirit. Yeah. Or, or limiting, yeah. Could he say that louder? We didn't hear it. He said the traditional view is quenching the Holy Spirit. Or limiting, yeah. So, spiritual, spiritual gifts tests are great, okay? They're great. They're a good start. 301's a good start, okay? But, like, for example, like, for me, when I take a, a spiritual gifts inventory, like, I always score really high on um, every gift in, like, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, right? When it says the, the manifestation of the spirits are faith and, you know, wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, I score really high on it. So, when I take a spiritual gifts test, um, all my, all the things in First Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 10, are used to really high for me, because truthfully, right, when I have to answer the question truthfully, I do see those in my ministry, not because those are my gifts, per se, right, because, but because in my ministry, God has given me the gift to be able to use that, the Spirit to manifest themselves through me. And, and I love what you said, Jerry, about, man, about quenching the Spirit. Like I said, the title of the class is Spirit Filled. And the idea is that we become people who have the understanding and the heart and the knowledge of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we can be vessels, instruments, in any way we go, any place we go, for the Holy Spirit to use us at any times. Because you know what? You know what? Um, uh, uh, some, you know, some, some, somebody may ask you to teach a group or teach a class or a, a, you know, a special event. You know, I don't have that yet. Well, why don't, if, if the Holy Spirit's leading you to do that, why don't you ask the Holy Spirit to give you that gift and to give you that understanding and that insight to empower you to serve the kingdom of God. See, the reason I didn't, the reason I didn't define the gifts is, is, is a very intentional reason. It's not about the gifts. And too many times we make it about the gifts. It's all about the service. It's all about the kingdom of God. So page 68. Um, I, I, I have uh, a case with a biblical alternative view. I have six points. Um, th there shouldn't be any blanks out of anything. So you should go off it, right? Number one. Not one person in the Bible tries to find out what special abilities they have been given. Can anybody tell me uh, of a person in the Bible that went on a quest to discover their spiritual gift? Stellar. There is not a single character, Old Testament, New Testament, before Christ, after Christ rose, there's not a single person in any of the Bible that just tries to discover what special abilities do you have, right? When God, when Jesus called the disciples, right, he said, come follow me, they followed him, and then the first thing they asked him was, hey, Jesus, what are my special abilities and special gifts? No, they just did it, right? They, and they just worked with the Holy Spirit to do the ministry. So number one is, there's no one in the Bible that has had tried to find out. Number two, the use of the word gift in the English language. 
So, when we translate the Greek word in, into our English word, gift, our, 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 our perception of, of gifts is sometimes skewed. So, on, on one, one, one way we see gifts is, right, we say, some, you know what, that, that girl, she's really gifted on the piano. Or that basketball player, he's really gifted on the basketball court. And that English word we use of gift, we, per, we, we perceive it as a special ability. When, when, I, when I was um, in elementary school, I was part of the GATE program. Anybody have GATE program on the East Coast? It was in the West Coast, thing. But GATE program was standing for Gifted and Talented Education. I was part of that. And it's this gift we have in, this, in, our, in our vocabulary and our language that connects us to talent and abilities. Number three, the Greek word charisma, which is the Greek word for spiritual gift, does not mean special ability. It doesn't mean talent, it doesn't mean special ability. It, is, it means that it is a spiritual gift, a presence from the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot more, so I don't want to go too much on this. Number four. In Paul's writings, in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, and Ephesians 4, his purpose for writing is to build up the church community. Paul's writings has always been about the church, to build the church up, to build the kingdom of God. Number five, the activities that Paul lists in Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and 1 Corinthians 12 can all be described as ministries, but they cannot all be described as abilities. Let me try to make that clear again. The list that he writes in Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, they can all be described as ministries, but they cannot be all described as abilities. Number six. The concept of ministry assignment is a common thread that leads its way through Paul's letters. The theme of special abilities is not an important theme in writing. You know, we, we all... Tell, you know, these were contextualized. Uh, read the Bible in context, you know. So, if you want to understand a word, read the rest of the verse. If you want to understand the verse, read the rest of the paragraph. If you want to understand the paragraph, read the rest of the chapter. If you want to understand the chapter, read the chapters before the end, and then the other, you know, the whole rest of the whole book. And, and to understand Paul, to take all his writings, because he's the one that, that has, that mentioned spiritual gifts, his theme through all his letters, is ministry. How do I be used by God? How can you be used as the church? How can you be used to edify one another? His themes of abilities don't come through any of his writings. If you read his writings as a whole, there's nowhere in his writings that have the theme of special abilities. It's all about your ministry. Alright, page 69. Page 69. This should be point number seven. I think that's where we're at. 80% of Paul's list, by the way, there's over 100 of them, places a word or a phrase that indicates the nature of the list in the immediate context. For Paul's list in Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, he uses words like pointed. He uses words like function. He uses words like Equipping. Paul wrote, told you, Paul wrote a lot of lists. And to understand his list, you need to look at the words, the keyword that he uses, and the words that, that you are appointed, you are equipped, right? There, you, have, you have functions as the body of Christ to do ministry. Those are his themes. Number eight. When Paul uses the words grace and given together, He's discussing ministry assignments, either his own ministry assignment or others, in the immediate context. So this, this is in two of the three lists. They use the word grace and the word given together. And he's talking about his and ours ministry assignments. Number nine, Paul talks in detail about his own ministry assignments and says that all believers have also received ministry assignments. Number 10, and this is what I love, the conventional view should is that service flows out of our strength, 
while Paul writes that we're called to minister out of our weakness. Paul writes that I'm, I minister not out of my strength, but out of my weakness. See, when I have a conventional view, I think, I think Carrie, that you said, about, about, that sometimes, sometimes you focus on your gift and your strength. But Paul was really big that as a minister of the gospel, I minister in weakness and brokenness and humbleness. Because the reality is, I can't. Well, when I look at the task before me in ministry, what God has called me to do to help his kingdom, I can't. I'm not smart enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I don't have the tools. I don't have everything I need to get the work done. And it is out of my weakness that I have to come before God so that He can give me strength. It is out of our weakness that I that I see God empowering people the most. Yes. Um. I have the form of a Tourette Center. Yeah. Uh, it's where I have muscle spasms. It's not your traditional known Tourette Center, mm -hmm. where uh, you may say there's anything. But uh, I was diagnosed with it as a teenager growing up, and you know, I was poked at and made fun of. Now at this point in my life to where I thought that things were weakness, I actually have the ability to feel a little bit more emotional yeah. or emotions yeah. more than most people. And it's humbled me in that sense of my own um, abilities, mm. you know, to help with my ministry. Mm. And, you know, it's given me the ability of yeah. insight to help with the ministry. To yeah. me, that's, you know, my weakness being in Tourette syndrome, but my ability being that I can recognize things more than possibly most. Yeah, thank you. There's a, there's a speaker called, uh, he has no Nick Vujicek. Yeah. You heard him? He has no arms, no legs, and he's a, he, he preached the gospel. He was on Oprah, and he was sharing the gospel, and he has no arm, no legs, and he is going, he goes all around the world, and he speaks to different churches in the gospel. And, and, you know, he tried to, he tried to commit suicide many times in his life when he was younger. Because he's like, no one's gonna marry him. He's a wife, by the way. Wife and kid. He was, he, when he was younger, he uh, wanted to commit suicide, and, and God miraculously prevented that from happening. Because God had a purpose for his life. And he did not let his weakness of having no arms and no legs prevent him from having a ministry, having a career, having a wife, having a kid. None of that, right? Because he decided that out of my weakness, I'm going to be used by God. But see, there are so many people in the Bible that we consider um, heroes, and they're not. The only hero in the Bible is Jesus. He's just the only hero in the Bible, and, and everybody else are people like you and me who have flaws and who have weaknesses. You know, the disciples had weaknesses, you know? They had issues. They, 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 remember when they yelled off Jesus? Who's the best? Right. Jesus, they, 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 they didn't finish his big ministry, right? And then and they're walking on a path, and they're getting an argument, a debate, who's the best? And, and isn't, isn't that sort of a natural human tendency to be like, all right, I just, okay, wow, look at what we just did with Jesus. All right, so what are we going to do that, right? So Jesus, rank me. One, two, three, four. Rank us one through twelve. Rank us who the best is. But, and they, they totally didn't get it. Right? Just because they're human. They're flawed with us. But you know what? In their weakness, Jesus used them. Right? And they changed the director into the trajectory of the, the church, the Christianity world, for the good. So Paul, I'm not going to read this passage, but I, I just wish that you can, you can read this, but Paul had a concern for one another. I, I just wish that some, there's much more, there's much more. But on the, on, on the bottom of page 69, I wish that different passages that Paul was writing, because he had concern for one another. Page 70, Paul used the body metaphor, like that we are the body, and, I, and I'm, so we're not going to read it on page 70, uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, these are Ephesians 4, these are all different areas 
that he uses the, 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 the body metaphor. But if you notice, these are also the passages that he lists the spiritual gifts or spiritual ministries, right? But he uses the body metaphor. So Paul was all about his themes in these passages were um, the body of Christ and one another. That if I'm in the body of Christ, my mission is to edify each other and encourage one another. So, uh, what are some key themes in Paul's body metaphor? So this is on page 70, and he should have some blank spots there. And these are just some different themes that he uses when he talks about the body and the body of Christ. So number one is unity. He talks about unity. That we all need to be unified in the body of Christ. Second one, Talks about diversity. That there's diverse number of people, of ministries, that people have diverse gifts. Right? We, like, we can't be envy over someone's ministry because we don't have that ministry. The idea is that the body of Christ is diverse. There's different there's arms and there's legs. And the idea is, and the, you know, he uses the, the, the human body as a metaphor, but it's a perfect one. Right? Because you know, we, the arm and the legs and the brain, and every part of us has to function together. And in the body of Christ, we all have a ministry that needs to function to each other to make the, the work go ahead. Number three, there is unity in diversity. So there's unity, there's diversity, and there's also unity in diversity. The fourth is that source. Source. That God is the one who placed the members here. That it is Jesus Christ's body. That Christ is the head that went through the members. And the Holy Spirit baptizes us into this body. Number five is need. 1 Corinthians 12, 21-22. Need. It's another theme. Another theme is honor. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 23 to 24. That passage talks about honoring one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 23 to 24. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25 to 26, Paul talks about caring for one another. Caring for the body of Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26. In Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, Paul talks about humility. Humility. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 and verse 15, he talks about edification, and that it is the edification of the body. Encouragement, uplifting each other, edification. And finally, the last little bullet point is that Christ is the head. Christ is the head of the body. Alright, so, we talked about that, it, that typically people will attribute four passages in the Bible as the spiritual gifts passage. And we went over those four passages, right? Three of those passages are actually spiritual ministries. And the fourth passage are manifestations of the Spirit, which we're actually going to spend a whole session on. So if you want to turn to page 71... Page 71. I'm going to go quickly through why each of these are ministries. So the first one we looked at was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. And these are ministries. And I, think, I think I wrote this down in your book. That this passage is a list of equippers that Christ has given the church. The list here is for equipping roles rather than special Abilities. So, let me use the reasons why 
And these are considered ministry not abilities. Number one, easy. Special ability is neither stated nor implied. Right? When, when, when Paul writes Ephesians 4, the idea of special abilities is neither implied nor is it stated. The second point on why this is listed as a ministry is this is it references ministry roles, not special abilities. It references ministry roles, not special abilities. And then the term grace and the word given this is number three, by the way. Number three. The terminology, the word used, grace, and the word given, refer to ministry assignments, not special abilities. That God has given us these assignments to the church. Say or, that, yeah. Say that one more time. Yeah. The, the word that he uses, the word grace, has been given, and these refer to ministry assignment, not special ability, especially the word grace and the word given. Number four, and this is sort of this is sort of a repeated, a repeated point, but it's a fourth point. The items listed here are ministries, are not special abilities. They're listed as ministries, not special abilities. Teaching, teacher, the prophet. Number five, um, this connects and links with Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 13. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 13. In Ephesians 3, you talk about ministry assignments. Right? So, like I said, to understand things, we look at the context of things. So, in Ephesians 3, you talk about ministry assignments, it has a direct connection with Ephesians 4. Four, they all have been in three assignments. Right? You, right, when, when, you, you have to remember that when Paul's writing, he's writing the things as a letter, as a, whole, as a whole piece of work. So, you know, in his style, he's not going to talk about the ministry assignments in Ephesians 3, and automatically a few paragraphs just jump, right, totally a different way, which is why it's, it's a clear case that this is connecting to ministry assignments. And number six, you look at all the key terms. If these pull key words from that uh, passage, they highlight ministries, not abilities. They highlight ministry, not abilities. So, number one, special ability neither implied nor stated. Number two, the references to ministry roles, not special abilities. Number three, Grace has been given as a ministry of not special abilities. Number four, items listed are ministries, not special abilities. Number five, ministry assignment linked with Ephesians chapter three. And number six, uh, key terms highlight ministry, not special abilities. Uh, Romans 12. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read all the reasons. I'm just going to give you a couple keywords, and that's it. And then, um, if you want to email me, I can fill you in the rest. But Romans 12, verse 6 to 8. This passage lists the diversity of ministry functions, people in those functions, and attitudes that should accompany those functions. Let me read that again. This passage lists the diversity of ministry functions, people in those functions, and attitudes that should accompany those functions. So. The, the key term is the use of the body analogy. So, so the main point I want you to look at, the main point that I want you to write down, is the use of the body analogy. Because, the reason that's so key, is because it's about functions, and how we are to function together in humility together, and to function together in love, and to, to function to uh, diversify each other.
right? That's, that's the key point I want you to point at. And if one of the other ones in detail, uh, I can give you that as well. Page 72. Page 72. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20 and 30 are ministries. This passage begins as a list of persons in their ministries whom God has placed or appointed in the church, and then it shifts to a list of ministries themselves. This passage begins as a list of persons in their ministries whom God has placed or appointed in the church and shifts to a list of ministries themselves. So the key point that I want you to write down is, because I'm not going to be involved, but the key point is that Paul talks about ministry, and then he talks about persons in those ministries. And with that, he lists the members and their ability. So, so Paul's writings are on ministry, and then his, he shifts in talking instead of, he, he goes, he lists ministries, and then after he lists ministries, he lists the people in those ministries, and that is his focus on, that the people being used in that passage. So we have the three passages that we looked at. We looked at Ephesians 4, why those should be looked at as ministries. Romans 12, why they should be looked at as ministries. 1 Corinthians 12, why they should be looked at as ministries. And the fourth passage that we covered, which we're not going to talk about, is 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10. And the reason we're not going to talk about that is because those are the manifestations of the Spirit, the Spirit empowering us. We're actually going to spend a whole session on defining that and what that looks like in our own lives. So, I know it's a lot to chew on tonight, but let me close with this. If you want to turn to Acts 8, please. Acts 8. So, you know, forgive me if I kind of threw a lot at you, and that was sort of the intention, is to kind of give you as much as I can on this, and what we can do in an hour, hour and a half. Um, this was a good talk on introducing the spiritual gifts, and a, a housekeeping note, we have no class next week, because it is the spring break for all the schools, so uh, if you have kids or you work at a school, you probably have plans. So, no class next week, but we're going to meet every week after that to the end of May. The, I wanted to get these first two sessions off the ground last week, Introduction to Spiritual Gifts, and this week, Understanding What Spiritual Gifts Are, because the next six sessions are very, very important, and they're very exciting, too. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the book, but it's, we're going to talk about knowing the gift giver. Know the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about how to operate in the presence of God with them, as, a, as being vessels in the presence of God. We're going to talk about what it means to have a theology of power in our lives. We're going to talk about the First Corinthians 12. What are the manifestation gifts of the Spirit? Session 7, we're going to talk about how we hear from the Spirit. How we hear. Because that affects our ministries. And number 8, we're going to learn what it means to activate the gifts of the Spirit. So I wanted to kind of pack as much as I could into one lesson and not carry it over until two weeks from now. So that way, when we get back from break, we can have a really good sort of launching point into some really meaty materials that are very practical. But before we end tonight, I'm going to ask you, and if you heard the uh, sermon uh, this weekend, uh, the passage was read uh, about uh, Simon. And uh, uh, as... Um, as I was listening to uh, Elder Pat Rod as an elder here in his sermon, um, an aspect of this struck me about um, how we need to uh, our our relationship with the gifts, and I wanted to end that tonight and sort of reply to our own lives. So uh, Acts chapter eight, verse eighteen through twenty-three. Acts chapter eight. Verse eighteen to twenty-three. If you're in the services, we can. Uh, talked about this, but I want to bring on another point from this that I want us to, to look at. Here's what it says. I'm starting at verse 18 of Acts 8. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying 
on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hand may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Verse 21. You have no part or share the ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So, so Simon, sorcerer, he was seeing people, right, having the gift of the Holy Spirit and doing amazing works of God. And, and Simon was operating in his mindset that I want that special ability. He said, I will give you money, and I have all this money. I can buy this. Just pray for me so I can have this special gift. And what Simon got wrong is that what we talked about tonight is it's not about the gift. It's about being used by the Holy Spirit. So Peter answers him, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You, can, you cannot buy this gift. Right? Because what Simon, Simon's goal is, I'm not going to get this gift so I can uh, impact the kingdom. Simon's goal was, I'm going to use this gift so I can make me look better, I can get more money, and I, and, and, and I can use this to my advantage. And what Peter says is, you have no part or share this ministry because you're heart is not right before God. Question for you to think about yourself is this. How's your heart? How's your heart? Is your heart in the right place? Are you in, the, are you in a season of your life where it's not? Sometimes we struggle with not being used by God. Sometimes we struggle not knowing where to be used. Sometimes we struggle with God not empowering us. We don't, we don't, we don't understand why. Right? Shouldn't it just be easy that this, this happens? But I think sometimes we need to go back and do constant evaluations of our heart. Right? How's my heart? How's my motives? How's my heart before God? You know, how are my thoughts? And, and what am I holding on to that God has not been the Lord of my life over? Because there are some things in our lives that we hold on to dearly, and we don't want to give it to God at all, and we want to keep it here, but we don't want to release it to God, but our heart isn't right. And then we wonder, why doesn't God use us? Why doesn't God use me in this way? Why can't I find the ministry? Why can't I, why can't I hear from God? Why can't I be used by this Holy Spirit? And we have to come back is to, how is my heart? The heart right before God. Years ago, um, I, uh, there, there's, thing, there's something in my life that I was um, praying for. My wife and I included, both of us. We were praying for this, God answered this prayer that we, that we desired in our life. And uh, it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And, and it's that struggle, right? You, you guys pray for it. Where you struggle with like, just working it out. Pray, nothing happens, you pray, nothing happens, you pray, and you pray. And after, after years of not uh, seeing this prayer fulfilled, I, and I realized that the request 
was actually an idol of mine, but I put that before God. So I was bringing God my requests and my desires, and because I was so focused on the answer, I was so focused on the result, I was so focused on what God wanted to do, and I want God to do in my life, I made that an idol and put that before God. So one day, it's like, all right, God, we're done. No more. No longer an idol. You know, we can give this to you. Sure, right? Surrender. Bam. God into that prayer. Just like that. As soon as, as soon as we got their heart right, and, and, we, and that prayer request stopped being an idol, and he gave it to God and said, we, I surrender to you. Our lives changed. God answered that prayer almost, almost immediately. So what I want to leave you with tonight, and over the next two weeks, is where is your heart? And is your heart right before God so the Holy Spirit can use you in ways you can never imagine? Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much that uh, you have brought us into... Uh, this place and into your presence by hearing this. Lord, um, I, I, I sense that there are many people in this room, a handful if not more, um, who just are struggling with finding the right ministry and place for you. So you can use them. And, and, I, and, I, and I sense questions, and I sense curiosity, and, and, and I sense uh, fear as well, not knowing what you have for them. So, Lord, I want to address that to the people in, 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 who are feeling that way in this room, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that, that you speak to them, speak into their lives. Whatever we need to let go of, Whatever we need to confess, whatever we need to bring before the cross, I pray that Holy Spirit, you illuminate our eyes to what that is. So, my prayer for us, Lord, is Holy Spirit, you give us a fresh pair of eyes, a fresh heart, a fresh mind, a fresh cure. Give us fresh senses. So that we may be able to sense and know how you're working in our lives so we can be used by you. We're here, Lord, because we want to be used by you. So may you make the paths in our lives, may you, may you make the pathways open so that we can be fully used by you. Probably in Jesus' name, amen.